Welcome to the first in a series of videos on Martin Heidegger's great The Metaphysical Foundations of Logic, a study of logic which, even within the title, has already presented something of a contradiction or counterintuitive conclusion to the modern reader in that, uh, of course, pursuing logic in contemporary analytic or logical positivist philosophy would lead you to have to abandon metaphysical questions. Um, the idea in logical positivism that you can speak meaningfully about facts, you cannot speak meaningfully meaningfully about essences. And if you can't do that, then you have to throw away pretty much all the old metaphysical terminology. But here, Heidegger is talking about metaphysical foundations of logic. That is the idea that metaphysical questions actually are something of a deeper foundation upon which logic is then built. But of course, to answer this, he goes back in classical Heideggerian sense to the etymology of that word we take for granted, logic. Of course, in ancient Greek, logos is in at some level the word and therefore uh, logic is the science of the word um, but what people really mean when they say logic now is the science of saying something about something that is a predication of a specific being and all of this together makes it into the science of thinking but of course the word in greek logos means something other than such a dry or formalist notion. For example, uh, logos, that's the same word that Heraclitus uses to mean something like fire um, that is the same word that in the beginning of the Gospel of John uh, is used to talk about the word which became flesh, but obviously that's not the word in this sense. And therefore, if you accept the modern notion that predication is a determination of an X that can be true or false, it doesn't quite answer the fact that determinative thinking has to measure up to a being in question. It, it has to have a certain accountability to the being which it is talking about. And these beings are not just one empty formal any X whatsoever, which they be treated in, in in modern formal logic or even in Husserl's formal ontology. Remember, for Husserl, formal ontology gives you the categorical and logical features of any X whatsoever, not just one from any specific region. But in reality, uh, if you're using the logos to say things about things, these beings can be of many different kinds. It's become difficult already to divorce logic from metaphysics. And there's a certain confusion that arises between wanting to provide these empty forms of clear thought that are true irrespective of whatever empirical content it fills them in, but wanting to treat the object as nothing in particular leads to the uh, contradiction of saying that logic is therefore about thinking about nothing. Therefore, there's a certain contradiction in which um, by providing these laws and formal rules for arriving at truth, uh, it does make sense at a certain level to say that logic is about correctness, but Heidegger asks if it's also about truth. This is a subtle distinction, which, even though the two are not really the same thing, he says that even thinkers as great as Kant had failed to distinguish them. Of course, historically speaking, Aristotle provided us with the syllogistic logic which Kant worked on and actually completed as a system. But Heidegger claims that the rigorous conception of a formal logic, far from being continued, develop, uh, continuously developed and then completed from Aristotle to Kant. He says, it has actually been developed only infrequently and never in principle. Um, he shows that this privileging of logic as the highest or most basic philosophical branch that you find in modern logical positivism, for example, actually provides us with a type of logic which is dry as dust, something he says does not speak to the students. He claims that this type of formal logic doesn't even provide a door into philosophy, but rather it leaves the students outside philosophy altogether. This conception of logic as something not only as not the highest branch of philosophy, but something that doesn't even let you into philosophy, is something which he argues, if you examine the proper history of logic, you will find something of a thread of development. But that thread was broken with Plato and Aristotle, and it was never really picked up again 
Despite many attempts from Leibniz to Kant to Hegel to the modern era to continue it into a supposedly complete system. His beef is really that every genuine problem, every genuine philosophical problem worthy of your attention, is a fundamental problem. And this, of course, led him to the most fundamental of all problems, Dasein. But he shows that standard academic disciplines and philosophy are so different that philosophy is not just one more academic discipline like the rest, not just one more academic department like the rest needing to measure up to the same standards as the rest of them. There's something inherently different going on in philosophy because real thinking about philosophy means reflection, but reflection means historicity. This is how Real philosophy is different from the dry and abstract logical formulas, which are otherwise equivocation, um, through equivocation, called thinking. Of course, this reflective historicity actually just means a concernful focus on the present, which means the unity of the temporality of philosophizing factical Dasein itself. Heidegger argues that even if we don't have a literal chronological recorded history of philosophy, uh, he doesn't necessarily mean philosophy, uh, history of philosophy in that sense. We'd still be able to, and we would still have to, do the properly historical thinking of getting away from the disoriented, psychologizing chattiness of modern philosophy, and instead try to get back to the primordiality of Greek philosophy. He quotes Aristotle's attempt to understand being qua being in the metaphysics, and of course, being is not just another being for Heidegger or for Aristotle. So posing the very question, let alone being able to solve it, requires a different type of entry into it and a different method. At this level, we can perhaps only even formulate this question negatively. Maybe the true object of philosophy is nothing belonging among beings as a particular being. This is also hard to talk about because it's overwhelming. It's not just the mundane and the everyday type of concerns that you find with this being or that being in life. Rather, you're dealing here not with a body of doctrines or a body of information like the other sciences. Rather, you're dealing with an object that has to be earned. But being is nonetheless prior to being because our foreknowledge of being precedes the determinate disclosure or the discovery of any mundane particular being. Thus, the real problem now is defining what a horizon is that's necessary for a true philosophical logic to move and to work through. Aristotle's question is no arbitrary one, but one that results from a fundamental stirring or an inclination regardless of historical gaps this drive towards asking about about being persists from him all the way down to us the history of various logics though is worth considering it goes something like this parmenides knows that we can only clarify what being is through reflecting on thinking and knowing plato's ideas are really just determinations of being Aristotle's categories are arrived at through reference to reason's predicative knowing of things. Descartes founds first philosophy on res extensa, just as Kant privileges the ego, and Hegel conceptualizes substance and subject. What matters for us is that being and logic are not so firmly separated, nor should they be, but instead something like Dasein's concern something like Dasein's care, is the true foundation of logic. Heidegger provides very fundamental insight into this by saying that understanding beings is a basic feature of existence. An existing being is therefore defined by transcendence, his version of that term, of course, or its understandingly comportment towards beings. This really takes the form of a thrownness among beings. This thrownness is not just one faculty on a long list, but it's the most fundamental feature of Dasein. Therefore, real truth, which is supposed to be the concern of logic, is not arbitrarily knowable position, propositions about matters of fact but is instead a certain, here's an unexpected word, loyalty of the philosophizing individual to himself. 
Of course, Heidegger clarifies this by saying that he's not at all saying that philosophers don't need to be knowledgeable about sophisticated systems of thought that precede them. Quite the contrary, if you don't know those systems and thinkers better than themselves, you'll repeat exactly what they said while thinking that you're being original. His real point is that unless this knowledge is only genuinely grasped, and if the whole of existence is seized by the root after which philosophy searches, then Frege's um, predicate you know, system, for example, of, with value ranges and value outputs of, of functions cannot capture this type of Dasein-level grasping of the whole. Heidegger admits, obviously, human existence is a new and fleeting thing in the universe's history and scope, but nonetheless, it can be the highest being if freedom, which is another feature of Dasein, is adequately grasped. Thus, maybe the real feature of truth is actually a type of freedom. He lists some well-known classic syllogistic laws, but he asks, what are the conditions of a Dasein? How is it constituted such that it, as a Dasein, can be regulated by such logical laws? This is the question that modern logicians never bother to ask. For example, Heidegger argues that the very concept of a law the very concept of an obligation, is not something that can exist simply in a formal, empty structural vacuum. Rather, the concept of a law or an obligation presupposes a certain kind of being that is free, and only that type of being. Being true means, therefore, a certain disclosure, a certain unconcealing, but that's subordinate to Dasein's transcendence, Dasein's characteristics as a clearing rather than just the things in a clearing, a clearing, a disclosure, truth as a type of event of unconcealing rather than simply a correspondence. Therefore, just as logical lawfulness is subordinate to Dasein's freedom, you have to um, understand that a more fundamental level is going to exist that will have to be the foundation for those possibilities themselves. Of course, logical determination, which is necessary for anything like a truth value, which modern logic concerns itself with, means determining as. But as we know from being in time, the as structure is a feature of Dasein, not something that exists formally and abstractly without any concern for Dasein. Thus, the connection between thinking and being means for Heidegger we must find the metaphysical foundations for logic. Heidegger lists the major figures but chooses to focus on Leibniz because in him the ancients are addressed, but he gives us also some new questions. Heidegger therefore goes over the uh, distinction in Aristotle, of course, in of interpretation between an element that has a meaning as a mere something, for example, Socrates is such an element, versus a complement that's added onto it, which um, while the uh, element itself is neither affirmative nor negative, you can um, enter into aff affirmative and negative statements by adding on a compliment like Socrates is a man or Socrates is not a man. This sort of linguistic formulation of logos really means that logos tells us about how things are connected to form true or false wholes. The truly basic unit is therefore the concept. Concept, judgments, and inference give you uh, a certain linkage of judgments and inference, but Heidegger refers to one of his favorite tangents from Being in Time about how Logos for the ancient Greeks really means something like a unity. Of course, the academic separation of various parts cannot recon reconstitute this unity of Logos through any simple exercise of addition of the type that Aristotle gives us by adding the complement onto the subject. So conclude video one. Look forward to more videos.